Holland has always been a great point for startups to try out new things, while at the same time you're being forced to look international. We just had to acknowledge we were not getting up to the speed of fraudsters evolving and money launderers evolving. The tendency then is of every human being say, well, I see the fraud, I'm going to stop the fraud because I don't want that fraud to happen tomorrow again. But they were getting smarter, faster. And so that was a big turning point of saying, okay, we need to change that approach. And you need a number of frauds before you figure exactly, out yeah. uh, what you're doing. But fraud is only 0.1% of your actual transactions. So that means you throw away 99.9% of your data. And old school game theory says fraudsters are going to change their behavior. They're going to try to circumvent your rules. They're going to adopt their behavior while normal customers won't. So how do I switch it around? How would I have found this type of fraud while not looking at the actual fraud itself? In some ways, my whole career was shaped by a decision someone in HR made before it even started. I was part of a graduate recruitment intake, one of a dozen like-minded kids chosen to help build out an experiment Capital One was running in South Africa. Now, we really could have been shuffled up and spread out in any order, but apparently, at the very last minute, my assignment was switched. So instead of joining the scorecard building team in the mass market loans division, that went to my water polo playing male modeling on the side colleague, and the credit card fraud team got me. Cue some light-hearted disappointment from some of my teammates, and for me, a career that was close enough to scorecard builders that I could eavesdrop on their chat, but not so close that I could do their job for them. So some of you know better, but I'd always simplified the concept of modeling by saying that the target variable should be the thing that is uncommon. Most people will repay their loan, so we model defaulters. Most people in collections don't pay, so we model propensity to pay. Most transactions are legitimate, so we model for fraud. But if you think about it for a minute, fraudsters are intentionally elusive. They actively change their patterns of behavior when the old ways stop working. Real customers don't do that. So we're aiming for a moving target when a still one is right there. Short slot, today's guest, thought about it and flipped the transaction monitoring model on its head. Welcome to How to Lend Money to Strangers with Brendan LeGrange. Short Slot, co-founder of Signo, welcome to the show. Thanks, great for being here. Signo provides automated machine learning software for transaction monitoring. So a fairly technical niche. What did your early career look like and how did it set the groundwork for what you're doing today? Well, I've never had any linear line in my life. Even going back to school, you know, I was great in math, horrible in, uh, in languages, um, dropped out sort of. I uh, came back in again. Same thing with the university, decided, you know, I want to change the world. So I, I ditched all my math and went to sociology and anthropology. Figured out I wasn't really good at that. Uh, <laughs> so finished it at some point in time, but did a lot of other stuff. Traveled the world, was active in a um, student organization called Isaac, which a lot of times still builds my international connections. Then decided to still want to change the world. Went to the United Nations, wrote economic reports uh, about the role of youth or the, the, the lack of the role of youth. Um, nobody was reading those reports or they were reading, but nobody was acting on it. What am I going to do with my life? Came back to Holland. Uh, didn't have a job, didn't have anything. Uh, well, then you can always go into the financial sector. <laughs> yeah. um, so so that, I think that that's actually really how I ended up in my career. Ended up in consulting in the financial sector. And then quickly actually figured out that the whole thing about in the financial sector is all about trust. You know, that's also your, yeah. your podcast. Yeah. Is If we could trust the other party, we could just put the money on the table. Uh, so if you can figure out what money is going out that shouldn't have left the institution... Well, then you've sort of figured out the trust part there. So with that in mind, I ended up in, in transaction monitoring, went from one project to the other. And then I, at some point figured out, we're, well, we're doing the same thing over and over again. It's great consulting. It's a great consulting model. You, you can charge high rates. There's always crisis uh, and you're doing the same trick, but you're not really helping customers there. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that sort of also ended up me getting started sick. Now I started thinking about, okay, so where did I end up now? And uh, what are we doing here? And does this make sense? Uh, if you just take a bit of distance from what we're doing, yeah. Yeah, because the strategy consulting, consulting yeah. world is good at training you to, to think strategically, yeah. to think broadly. 
But it's still a big leap from, from telling people how they should run their businesses to actually starting your own business. So what yeah. was that spark that got you to say, I'm actually going to go and do it myself? Yes. Yeah, so, so the honest decision, of course, is typically uh, when you're a founder coming from a career path is that you have an idea and nobody else is doing it. Uh, at some point, you, uh, people are telling you, well, maybe you should start <laughs> doing it. Uh, and that's the actual thing. So I started with a couple of clients and we were just thinking about how do we solve this problem? And, and you know, there was, this was the time when fraud was really hard to detect. In the past, you could have fraud rules live for a couple of years, you know, in the credit yeah, card yeah. space and in the in insurance space. Uh, same with money laundering, you know, those rules would exist for five or 10 years easily. But we were chasing, you know, men in the browser attacks, uh, men in the middle attacks and th stuff like that, skimming uh, attacks that were moving countries. So the speed of evolving was so fast that the old school approaches weren't working anymore. And so my client was desperate to say, well, I'm losing a lot of money or my clients are losing a lot <laughs> of money and we're reimbursing them. And how do we detect them? I said, well, every week we're adjusting the rules and every week we're trying to figure out what they're doing. We're having big forensics teams figuring out what they're doing. The only thing we can now still do is try to be ahead of them. In the end, they're going to do something that it doesn't make sense for a normal customer to do. And so if you monitor on that, I think you can actually get ahead. And so my customer says, well, do you know how to do it? I said, well, I don't know, but I can ask around if there's some smart folks around. Give me a server, give me some data. So I, I hired some Harvard guys and we just started a project and said, well, let's try out on 12 terabytes of data if we can actually figure out how to detect fraud. And uh, we got it to work, of course, not in a productized way, you know, project way, et cetera. But the idea worked and, and that's sort of when we thought, well, this might actually be something that we want to continue on. And I don't want to jump yeah. too far ahead at once, but my first job was in credit card fraud detection. And at one stage, we were being hit by a syndicate. We had just launched the first sort of major premium card in the market. We were very proud of it. And it started getting hit by fraud. It was the very early days of online fraud. So technically, we weren't losing any money because we could charge back at all. But it was happening so fast that you know, these are premium uh, customers of the bank. We would phone them and say, we've picked up some fraud on your card. Don't worry, we've closed the card. We're sending you the new one. And it used to, in those days, take about a week to yeah. print out a card and, and get it to the customer. And in that week, we'd have to phone them back and say, actually, sorry, yeah. the new card also has some fraud on yeah. it. So we've closed that one and we're sending you a yeah. new one. And the, the, the impact just from the brand was horrific. And it wasn't a very complex one. I won't go into sort of how we fixed it quite easily, but suddenly we were moving from a world where fraud was somewhat random. It might hit one customer every 10 years to, okay, we've been hit by someone who understands the system and the system is too inflexible to, to fix it. We just didn't have the capacity to model data like we can today. So that's something I'm going to pick up later on, on how you've come around to that. But first... I want to talk a bit about that founding experience. What was the fintech world like, the startup world like in the Netherlands 10 years ago? And what do you see it like today as a, as a founder having been sort of part of that journey? A lot of things are still the same. Holland is too small of a country to run a big business on, but large enough to run a good test environment on. So you can actually test things in a market. It's a mature market, great technology, people adopt technology. And so Holland has always been a great point for startups to try out new things because it's small enough if you sort of hit the, hit the wall here, you know, you're not losing reputation on a big market. Uh, you can try things out, you can pivot and they're going to adopt it. Uh, well, at the same time, you're being forced to look international. Uh, we do a lot of business in the U.S. right now. If you're a U.S. startup, you know, Europe, you wouldn't even consider it. You yeah. know, it's too much of a hassle, etc. For, for a Dutch startup, you know, you're going to have to go abroad. You're going to have to look around. Same thing with, you know, international connections, conferences, you know, people love coming to Amsterdam. So therefore we have a lot of conferences. So a lot of times we can go to a conference without having <laughs> yes, to have all the yeah. costs of travel uh, and the time. And so that, that's a great uh, part there. But yeah, the, 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 I think the involvement we've seen is a lot of accelerators coming up. I think that's a good thing. Historically, a lot of those accelerators were connected. And I'm, and I'm going really back to the beginning of the century. I was at the Entrepreneurial University in Twente. You know, we had this great stuff. And, you know, the, the guys from Booking.com came from there. And uh, just the takeaway guys are coming partially from there. So uh, that was a great time. If you, if you look around, which great businesses yeah. evolved from that. But if you didn't look at my type of startup, which is a professional coming out of a professional career, that type of accelerator was existing you know i we really just had to figure the thing out i think there's much more accelerators now for more mature founders taking a different uh, risk but also take more experience in terms of knowing the market understanding the market which of course when you're in regulatory compliance it does help <laughs> if you uh, understand a bit what a regulator thinks like i think that has really matured i've, I've seen a lot of uh, folks i've talked to in the, in, uh, in the last couple of 
you know, two, three years, which have gone into great programs like Andler, you know, that really helps yeah, uh, yeah. founders like that to really get started when you're not, you know, a university student that is just going for it. Because I think that we're then getting uh, startups to work in mature markets where you do need the experience, you do need to understand really the deep domain knowledge that is present there, but still getting people who think slightly different, who have different ideas, have different approaches and actually can solve problems. So I think that's the biggest leap forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, London's crown is always yeah, at risk yeah. thanks to some yeah. uh, some voting public. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. a lot of good news and good energy around the, oh. the startup fintech world. Um, but let's, yeah, let's come back to the, the yeah. main subject. No good catch bad. Talk to me in sort of practical terms about what that means. And I guess what inspired that philosophy that flips the traditional credit modeling that became the traditional fraud modeling approach on its head. Yeah, like I said earlier, a couple of things really triggered it. First of all, we, we just had to acknowledge we were not getting up to the speed of fraudsters evolving and money launderers evolving. They were getting smarter, faster. Uh, we were closing down money, leaving to certain in countries. And within two weeks, they had money mills in the Netherlands. And yeah. we, suddenly had, we had, suddenly had a domestic problem. And so that was a big turning point of saying, okay, we need to change that approach. And you need a number of frauds be before you figure exactly, out yeah. uh, what you're doing. So that didn't, didn't work either. And the same part is we were struggling with legacy systems. And so a lot of that legacy system didn't have the data that we thought was needed to detect, you know, those advanced frauds. And so we said, well, you know, you can't just create data out of air. And so then we said, well, what happens typically is when you have a case, a case manager will tell you what's different than what you would expect for this customer in this situation. The tendency then is of every human being say, well, I see the fraud, I'm going to stop the fraud because I don't want that fraud to happen tomorrow again. And I still have customers asking me, how does your approach help me detect that specific fraud that I had last month or last year? And we typically have to tell them, well, I don't know. I can only say, well, overall, we're going to find far more than you're finding right now. We're going to stop far more. We're doing uh, in the cybersecurity, it's called the zero day attacks. We're going to be very early on uh, detecting new types of fraud. We're going to have far less false positives because when you extrapolate, you know, what you see in a certain fraud, the things that you're seeing there are going to be extrapolated to a lot of good customers as yeah, well. Specifically, yeah. though, I think the ones you're mentioning, you know, the, the, the more high-end customers doing exotic types of behavior. For them, that's normal. But, you know, other people travel internationally as well. Other people do high payments, etc. So how do I switch it around? How would I have found this type of fraud while not looking at the actual fraud itself? So it's really disciplined in terms of modeling. But if you switch it around, old school game theory says fraudsters are going to change their behavior. They're going to try to circumvent your rules. They're going to adopt their behavior while normal customers won't. They have an intrinsic motivation to do that type of behavior because that's what they want to do. They want to transfer yeah. money to their grandmother or to their grandkids or whatever. The other side is also fraud is only 0.1% of your actual transactions. So that means 99.9% .9 of your data is about yeah, non-fraud. <laughs> so if you want to detect fraud, you throw away 99.9% .9 of your data. And, and we're looking quite often, those projects about our data enrichment, data quality, because we're focusing on the 0.1%. Yeah. But w when we started, we said, well, if we focus on 99.9% .9 of the data, we, don't, we still have data quality issues and we would always like more data. Yeah. But a little bit of data on 99.9% .9 of data is far more than a lot of data on 0.1%. And so once you switch that around, it suddenly makes sense. And in cybersecurity, we see this. You know, network detection, virus detections, hardly any of them are doing fingerprinting on the actual viruses or, or attacks. They're all doing fingerprinting on what is the expected behavior for this device to be doing. It just makes so much sense that if I've got two different fraudsters both acting on my account, you could be asking how similar is the activity of those two fraudsters, potentially entirely unconnected, but both are different to me. So yeah. whether or not they're doing something similar to each other, whether they're doing two completely different frauds, it's highly unlikely that that transaction looks anything like mine. And yeah, it's something that we had seen before, as I said, I don't want to bring it back away to transaction fraud in the credit card world, but I think it was 90% of credit card transactions happened at a merchant that the good customer had used in the last few months and very little of the fraud. Uh, almost none of the fraud happened at a merchant you'd used before. But we couldn't do it analytically. We just didn't have the computing power to do it. On that, what, from a technological point of view or data point of view, needed to happen to enable you to process in reasonable time the 99% of data, the full base of good customer behavior, and to use that as the, the seed? Absolutely. So I think the advancement in terms of calculation and uh, compute power has really helped us. And also, you need to be smart on what kind of questions you're asking the machine to calculate for you. And this is also what we do. We try to do pattern recognition. So we first try to figure out the pattern before we turn it into a model. 
the faster we can do it, the easier we can do it on the larger volumes we can do it. And that really helps. But the other hand is also if you want to have fraud fingerprinting profiles, which not a, a lot of parties are, are trying to do right now. You have to share that information. You know, there's a lot of technological challenges coming in place. You have to keep up with that. I think that's also one of the reasons why in the virus scanner world, you're not maintaining the virus libraries anymore because they're just huge. And yeah. there's no way you can, you can keep that and compute against that in a, in a quick way. So the model generation is a very compute intensive because we need to do pattern recognition. We need to figure out what is this data all about? What's happening here? Who are the customers? Who are the entities acting here? Uh, but once we've calculated the model that you actually put into your transaction monitoring system, we typically reduce the computing power needs because it's spot up. It's not something that people thought, well, this might work. And then we make an exception rule and we make yet another exception. Yeah. <laughs> we build rule upon rule upon rule, which becomes very slow. Now, we, we use all the computing power in generating the model. But once the model is generated, that's the spot on model that actually works. Yeah. And so that has far less steps in it than the average, you know, organically grown fraud detection rules uh, base. Yeah. And let's talk about what it looks like in a, in a product, because I don't want to yeah. derail this with yeah. my reminiscing about yeah. my fraud days. Yeah. What does the Signo product look like? How is it used by your customers? What industries is it used in? Yeah. So it's used in fraud and anti money laundering anywhere where transactions happen. So we have customers in the historic uh, world of card issuing and acquiring, uh, wire transaction, online banking, Correspondent banking, we're currently talking to and working with some customers in the funds and trust businesses, in the payout of insurance claims. So that's we're still talking about the actual payment yeah. transaction, not so much the claims uh, detection. And it's being used by banks, payment processors, core banking processors. Everybody was already sitting on that payment saying, well, I want to add this service for my customer or for myself. Now there can sort of be a question of, well, can we see what's happening? Do we understand what's happening? But you're very big on transparency, I see on the website. But in the fraud world, then we start to say, well, if the model's transparent, are we showing fraudsters our hands? Are we giving too much away? So how do you balance the need to be transparent, to have rules that the regulator can see and understand and be happy with, with having systems that are uh, protected against fraudsters? Well, let's go back to your example you were giving about, you know, we don't see a lot of fraud with merchants that the customer has already been with. We do see that. Uh, because what happens is when you when you harvest a card, you're going to make a very small transaction that the customer couldn't be bothered about. I think, what is this? But I'm not going to make a fraud report about it because it's just a couple cents. Yeah. And suddenly you see a week later or a month later, you suddenly see a big harvesting of, of the, the catch. So a simple rule that would have said, if the customer has already been at this merchant, you know, let's yeah. not look at it anymore. That's currently, that's one of the main attacks that we're seeing. So what is important, we always just talk about models. Those are a combination of rules uh, that need to work in conjunction with each other. So it's not one rule if i just circumvent one rule i need to be able to circumvent multiple rules and it needs to stay under multiple radars which is already more yeah. difficult <laughs> and then we adjust those radars to the individual what we call entity behavior that can be a customer that can be an account that can be a cart that can be a terminal that can be a merchant i'll give a very simplified example if you stay under the average of this customer but your average is going to be different than my average is going to be different than everybody's average so i need to figure out on the individual customer level what is normal for this customer probably against an, ind an individual merchants on the other side of the transaction. Yeah. And so then it becomes really difficult. And game theory tells us if it's difficult to predict, I'm just going to go for what's easy to predict. I'm going to go somewhere else. When you're applying these new techniques, is it possible to have explainable AI in this space? Is it possible to have rules that are you know, on the cutting edge in terms of uh, the technology, the modeling that we have available to us today, but that we can actually explain to a regulator or to a customer what it's doing? You need to look into what are you doing with the AI and what are you coming out of. And I think one of the great benefits for us is we come out of the market, but we've also started with, you know, we want to work with the legacy systems that our banks and payment processes are working with. And because if you want to change your transaction monitoring system, you know, you're going to take two or three years to do yeah. that project. So we said we have to work with those systems. Those are typically rule-based or very lightweight model type of system. And so that really helped us also in the explainable part, because when we say explainable, we also mean comprehensible. You can, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, shapely value type of explainable AI things that you can do. The difficulty is not so much explaining it in terms of that another data scientist can understand it. The difficulty is that a legal compliance officer it has no mathematical background can yeah. still understand what you're doing. So then we say it has to be comprehensible also. If you cannot explain it to your grandmother... And so we use all the AI machine learning to do the pattern recognition, to, to make that lightweight model, which is, an, in the end, is just a simple rule set with a scoring and decisioning uh, rule on top of it. So we use a very computing-intensive, machine learning-intensive approach 
to come up with something that is pretty straightforward and that you can actually print on a paper. And we have a rule in our, in our development teams that if you can't print a model on less than four pages, it's not comprehensible anymore. <laughs> People are going to lose track of it. And so you have to come down to, okay, so how do I use the machine learning to do all the pattern recognition in the data? But I need to normalize it at some point to something that I can explain to somebody who doesn't have a mathematical background and says, well, I wouldn't have come up with it myself, but it does make sense. Just like the old fraud expert would have come up with rules that the average business person thinks, well, I wouldn't have come up with it, but, but I can see your experience here. You yeah. come up with some intuition thing. Another thing I saw in that AI realm on, on your website is a focus on these unintended biases. Uh, now, obviously, bias in AI or in modeling is quite closely linked to explainability. So what, what is the philosophy at, at Cigna around working around bias and, and how do you make sure it's not accidentally inbuilt? Yeah, so when you look at a lot of the financial crime approaches, again, coming back to you have a very limited data set, you know, limited crime that you're extrapolating uh, on limited parameters to the whole audience. And that's when a lot of these biases come out. Uh, so and the Dutch regulator just published a new statement last week together with the Dutch uh, banks saying we want to stop the de-risking of the banks. So they are they have been cutting out, you know, all types of associations, types of businesses that were high risk because there was a couple of frauds or a couple of money launders in that business. Yeah. Of course, there is more risk in certain businesses than others. We, we know that. A lot of banks will say, well, I don't want to do business because I don't want to get the fine. I don't want to get the remediation program. And that really leans on the approach of saying, I see fraud, I identify fraud or money laundering, and I'm going to extrapolate what I'm seeing to all the other businesses in that same domain. And so a lot of the biases issues, uh, there's always bias in there because you're, that's what machine learning does, but the biases that... Ha that are getting issues are those type of issues are saying there's a certain type of business we've seen fraud there and we are not able to distinguish between the fraudsters and the non-fraudsters in that business efficiently or effectively so therefore we're just <laughs> going to rule out the whole business or people making transactions to certain countries because that's our home country yeah. etc and so when you turn it around and say well if i can go on an individual level saying this makes sense for this individual this is probably legitimate behavior of this individual you've made transactions in this country or you're in this type of business or you're this type of person or living in this neighborhood etc I can suddenly go on their actual individual behavior and say, well, this does make sense. And especially when you think about the levels of risk that make banks nervous, yeah. the bank's not going to take a 10% risk on, on no. a loss. So I mean, it's still be nine yeah. out of 10 people yeah. in that neighborhood yeah. or in yeah. that industry yeah. or that country yeah. are perfectly good. Being able to see past these sort of redlining is, is a massive impact on so many people's lives. And specifically in the ethical side is where you want to enable the people that want to do good, but just come from a bad background yeah. uh, or have a bad name or have some, you know, something that at some point somebody thought, well, I see a fraud and I'm going to look at the very obvious stuff out there. Uh, or maybe, you know, they thought it was obvious. And I'm going to just mark everybody that has the same characteristics. Quite often it's 99 out of 100 that are doing good and it's only 1% that's bad. Then you're already quite high. Yeah. Um, so you want to make sure that all the other people are, are being able to do the business that they want to do or make the transaction that they want to do. And it goes both ways. It goes for people who are underprivileged as well as for people who are privileged. Uh, I've been traveling to, uh, also to, to New York or Washington with some folks who used to work at a bank. And the first thing they did when they arrived at JFK was go to the ATM and take out cash. And I was like, why are you guys taking so much cash out? And they go like, I have three credit cards already on me, but I know when I'm going, I haven't been to the US for because they we're talking post-COVID here. You know, I haven't yeah. been here for a long time. And I know the mechanisms of how my bank operates because I used to be responsible for that. <laughs> so I said, I know they think I, you haven't been to the US for for the last two years, you know, due to COVID. So we're going to block that card. And even if I have three cards, probably by the end of tomorrow, all my three cards are going to be blocked. But this is totally normal behavior for me because I, I am an international traveler. I, you know, I have funds, etc. So the strange thing is a lot of false positives are hitting the underprivileged and the, and the really privileged ones. And for a bank, one of them is an ethical, but also a business opportunity side because there's, there's great people that want to do their business, want to do their transactions. And the other side is also a lot of business for a bank or a payment process. That's the people that you want to have in your, in your portfolio. I guess 80% of people are in the middle and the either 10% are getting caught, but the 10% on the top end have the ability to phone and, and yell, at a, <laughs> yell at someone in the bank and get it fixed, but uh, the other 10% don't. Have oh, absolutely. That. 
Sure, your website is one of the nicest designed ones I've seen. Really cool animations and also just lots of good content on there. Where should people go if they want to try and get their heads around there? I know there's some videos on there that explain the concept as well. Well, the website is signo.com, so S-Y-G-N-O.com. Always great to be there. I think we have tried indeed to look slightly different because we have a different approach. We also don't want to go to the market with the you know, old school blue orange type of um, <laughs> proposition. And also to trigger people thinking, you know, what are we doing in this market and, and what can we do differently? So go there. There's, there's great content. Follow our LinkedIn page because there's some great content coming on there. Be part of that discussion. We are at events as well, or people can approach me or my colleagues directly. We are at, at the stage in, in where the market is, is making a shift. And this is an interesting time. It's great for us to be part of that shift. And I think we're really seeing it where... You know, U.S. regulators pushing for fraud today, email integration, for model management, for how do you detect the unknown risk, the ethical parts of all those false positives that are being generated. So it's a great shift where the market needs to move away from the old school. I've seen the frauds and I'm now I think I know all fraudsters to I've seen a good customer and now I know what a good customer looks like. That's a great conversation that we want to be part of and we want to hopefully lead, but uh, definitely be an active member of. Hey, yeah, and I want to close picking up on that point from your experience working right there being one of these change makers what are the trends that you're looking at the moment that uh, those that are not as directly involved should be keeping an eye on first of all the integration of fraud and money laundering you know in the end it's money going from a to b that shouldn't have gone from a to b whether it's fraud or money laundering it doesn't really matter for a regulator and you know who's a money mule are you money laundering or fraud you know so that's a big part and then the whole how do you detect the unknown risk? I think the regulators are really caught up with like, okay, so the old approach doesn't work anymore when the risk is, is evolving that fast. So how do you detect something that you don't know yet? This, yeah. You know, what, what we call in cybersecurity, the zero day attacks. And so how, how do you make sure that you have all these controls in place, but they're sufficient for something that you haven't seen yet? And the last one, I think that's the most recent one, is model management. So in the past, credit card models could exist for five or 10, maybe sometimes even 15 years or money laundering rules as well. You looked at them, you thought it's going well, it's fine. Right now, the regulator is pushing for a model evaluation every 18 months, but probably coming down to 12 months and maybe even more. If you look at the average model project, you know, so we, of course, are software that generates those models, so that, that's a couple hours of compute time. But in the most of the banking world, it's still project-based, you know, human-based data science. Those projects last longer than 12 months, yeah. and those backlogs are two to three years easily. If you then say, well, you're going to make a model, but you're going to reevaluate it every couple of months, those number of data scientists cannot be recruited in the market anymore. Uh, so that's going to require a whole different type of approach. It also speaks back to that idea of, of modeling the good, because we put yeah. a model in place that's turning away bad. So now we're filtering through hopefully far fewer. If you need to rebuild it in six months, you don't have the, you know, the, the data stock of bad customers to model. Whereas if you're doing the good customer, yeah, you've got that multiple of 90 odd uh, times more data. And the good customer is going to be more stable in their behavior. So where the fraud side probably has changed in those six months, the good customer does a little bit. You know, we've, we've worked through COVID, we've worked through the current inflation. So there is definitely changes in behavior. Uh, but overall, our models are very resilient against those, those changes. And they handle zero day attacks far more efficiently than, than the old school fraud rules. I think also, just in closing, from a consumer point of view, it makes for a far more understandable impact if you do get caught up in a process. If that is related back to me and saying, well, you don't normally do this, versus the other approach where you fly to America yeah. and you, your card stops working and say, because you're in America, and you say, well, yeah, I've been here 10 times, even a country you've not been to before. You, you should be able to fly to uh, Canada the first time and say, well, yeah, I've not been to Canada, but I've traveled to four or five countries. That's where it gets frustrating, where you say that you've got everything on hand to yeah. see who I am, but you're blocking me. That even if you were to be impacted as often, you'd rather be impacted for behavior that's unusual for you than behavior that's unusual for the average. So, yeah, it's really interesting space. Also, just exciting for me to see where it is compared to uh, what it was 20 years ago, that there really is just as much data innovation, data work happening uh, in the back end as there is, or maybe even more now than, than in the front end. But sure, thank you so much for coming in. Great to be here. It's been really interesting to, to hear what you're doing at Signo. Thank you very much. It was great to be here. And thank you all for listening. Please do look for and follow the show on your favorite podcast platform and share the updates widely on LinkedIn, where lending nerds are found in our largest concentration. Plus, send me a connection request while you're there.
This show is written and recorded by myself, Brendan LaGrange, in Brighton, England. Show music is by I Am Wake, and you can find show notes and written transcripts at www.howtolendmoneytostrangers.show. And I'll see you again next Thursday.